Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you for tuning in to the first ever episode of the Full Spectrum Podcast. My name is Jordan Peitzman. I am the host of the Full Spectrum Podcast. I am also the promoter and founder of Midwest Tournament Series Subspectrum. I am a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu purple belt under Jared Barr and Cliff Harris at No Coast Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu here in Urbandale, Iowa, and overall just a lover of the sport of Jiu-Jitsu. I'm a competitor. I'm a teacher. Uh, I really just love this sport, and I want to continue to see it grow. And nowadays, that means starting your own podcast. Uh, my friend and I, Derek Flagg, he is the guest on the podcast today. He is a longtime training partner of mine, and when we trained together back in the day, I say back in the day like it was... Uh, months or years ago, it was just earlier this year, uh, we had talked about starting a podcast together and he recently took a hiatus from the sport and during his hiatus from the sport, he uh, actually moved himself to Arizona where he is now training again. So we're just going to get him on the podcast today and uh, start answering some of the questions regarding his hiatus away from the sport and uh, what took his life to Arizona. And for the first time ever, we are live. I'm here with uh, my good friend Derek Flagg, a uh, former training partner of mine. How you doing, man? Doing good. Back in town, enjoying the snow. Don't miss it at all. I bet. Uh, how's that Arizona weather treating you out there? It's not bad. It It's a little bit different, but I'm okay with it. I mean, most of my time spent training and lifting and stuff, so I don't I occasionally get out and hike, but nothing too crazy. Yeah, man. So that's something uh, specifically I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I, I will cover this a little bit uh, in the preview that I do right before the podcast, but uh, me and Derek were longtime training partners. Well, not long time, but we were trained together for about two, two and a half years here at No Coast, and then uh, you took a little bit of time off and then uh, recently moved to Arizona. So I just kind of wanted to get uh, some of your thoughts on uh, you know, why, why you took that little hiatus from jujitsu. I mean, I think, I think we all need it sometimes. Sometimes we train way too much and, uh, it's good to just take some time off and think about things, but I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that and, uh, the reasons that you took that time off and ultimately what moved you to Arizona and, uh, what's gotten your life started out there. Yeah. So with the time off and everything, I kind of just wanted to get to a situation. I didn't like the person that I was becoming. I was too dedicated to certain stuff and just overall just being a dick and I didn't like it I kind of had some reflection around that and I was getting burnt out with jiu-jitsu and just traveling all the time um, it was like a month and a half after the Ana Invitational and there's just been a lot of traveling a lot of things going on so I just wanted to take a break from it and take a step back um, I ended up taking three months off and then coming back to train in Arizona moved to Arizona with my girlfriend she accepted a job down there I wanted to move away from Iowa for a while, so I just took the chance. Uh, I'm training down there now at a place called TNT uh, MMA. It's a gym ran by a fourth degree black belt named Scott Tannenbaum. He is a Higgy Machado black belt, fourth degree, like I said. It's actually really funny, it kind of comes full circle, is he actually used to be a training partner of Eric Paulson's when they're blue belts. Very nice. So, yeah, so yeah. as you guys, uh, some of you might already know, uh, we are affiliated under Eric Paulson here at No Coast Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is where we're recording the podcast today. So uh, pretty crazy that uh, Derek goes out to a completely different school in the middle of Arizona and still ends up being somehow tied to Eric Paulson. Uh, it seems like he's tied to just about everything in MMA and Jiu-Jitsu nowadays. Uh, was that one of the reasons that you tried that school out, or was there... Uh, so preliminary reasons there I was looking at a lot of different schools and I was actually talking to one of the people who trains here it's a good friend of mine Jim Morris about where I wanted to train and I wanted a place that was going to be no gi heavy and if they did gi that's fine uh, but I didn't want something that was all gi and I didn't want something that was completely IBJJF standard as well so he actually found this place because previous to this I was going to go to a different gym can't remember which one it was but they only offered no gi like two days a week three days a week which is pretty standard around there the sub only movement is not very popular there um i don't know if it just hasn't infiltrated the area or it's just set with a lot of standards in that way just old school because it's whatever makes like megatons down there and all of that so i don't know how influential he is in the area but jim found this place and a lot of the coaches involved there as well are also lifters heavy lifters like 
national record power lifters. Nice. So that kind of fits right into your, yeah. your style for sure. So you hit the weights pretty hard. I remember right before you left. Yeah. So Jim found that. And then there's this guy, his name's Jimmy house who he does a lot of competitions. He, well, I think he was in Olympia like for powerlifting and he's just an all around like animal. He, he's a freak. He was a wrestler in high school. He's a wrestling coach out there. And that was also one of the reasons I went out there. And they're all no gi. So every day they have a no gi class. So that just fits my style. And another thing being with my style is allowing of leg locks. I didn't want to go to a school that was like no leg locks. So I kind of just, Jim found it, showed it to me. And was like, all right, I'll give it a try. And the very first night I was like, yep, I'm staying here. Nice. So went to there. And now I'm just full blown again, going to whatever tournaments I can find. It's kind of funny you mentioned the thing about leg locks. Anybody that's watched Derek knows that uh, a high percentage of his wins come by leg locks, specifically, uh, I'd say, outside heel hook most often. Uh, uh, maybe some inside heel hooks here and there. But uh, regardless, you know, very high percentage of the finish is coming by leg lock. Uh, so that gym, it's it's TNT MMA, right? Yeah, so yeah. are you training with a lot of other MMA people, or is <laughs> it mostly jiu-jitsu guys in the yeah. MMA program? or? It, in their no-gi jiu-jitsu, they, they have a foundation that's very MMA oriented. So they're very top heavy pressure. Don't give up a position for submission, um, especially if punches are involved. But their no gi also allows for like some days it'll be MMA oriented, some days it'll be IBJJF oriented, some days it'll be sub only oriented. It just depends on the day. But with the tournaments that are coming up, it's right now it's very sub only oriented because. Granted, because uh, coming up in the Arizona area, there's Grappling Industries, Fight to Win. There's a bullpen submission series in Tucson, which is like two, two and a half hours away. Mm-hmm. And then trials coming up. So there are points ones involved, but there are also sub only one of tournaments involved, but not really much MMA. I don't know how much MMA is actually involved. I know there's a lot of Muay Thai fighters out there as well. Gotcha. So nice. it, it's a little bit of everything, to be completely honest. Sweet. And I noticed you mentioned bullpen submission series. It sounds like you're going to end up doing their Purple Hain event. Yeah. Uh, sounds like Hanato Laranja is going to be out there for uh, a seminar, and then they're putting on a, a Purple Belt-oriented event. Uh, yeah. You were a Blue Belt, so yes. you're jumping up and uh, facing some Purple Belts out there. Yeah, I'm not too worried about that. I think with the time, because last year I also took time off, but that was due to injury in 2017. I had the two different knee, knee injuries. So, altogether, I've taken probably uh, three months here, and then I think it was about three months previous because I had six weeks with each knee. Um, that got hurt. Oh, yeah. I know the problem. I'm going through a little MCL rehab right now. Yeah. So, send it three years, three and a half years, whatever it may be. For it, yeah, I'm still pretty confident in what, um, what to expect. I'm not too worried about having to go up. It's about time anyway. So... I'm not too worried. And then I'm doing, I applied to fight to win as a purple belt to nice. see if I can get something in there. And then I'm doing grappling industries. Uh, I think it's like their advanced or whatever their highest level is as well. So yeah, I'm really trying to throw myself into the fire out there nice. and I'm doing trials. So nice. we'll see how that goes. Very nice. Those are February 9th, correct? Yeah. Right. So it's like, I think we're going to fly out there just to avoid LA traffic, but uh, me and two others, there's a, Another gentleman on my team, his name's Nick LaRosa. He is a, I think, he reminds me a lot of Danny Prokopos, except for the tinfoil hat area. Of like, course. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's been doing jiu-jitsu since he was, I think he said 13. He's a black belt in judo and a black belt in jiu-jitsu as well. So he's a fun training partner to have. But he's like 170 to 155 or somewhere in there. So he's not huge, mm-hmm. but it's a fun training partner to have that has a lot of knowledge. And then... The person I spoke about earlier, Jimmy, is also doing trials with me. So us three are going to go out to Burbank. And I'm just going to throw it out on the line because, honestly, like I don't have too high of expectations when I go out there. I'm a blue belt that has X amount of years of experience. My goal is just to get a win. Like, And I'm never going to be somebody that goes out and wins ADCC or trials or anything. I just don't have the... If I ever did do that, I'd be very shocked because I don't have the level of dedication um, that the people that deserve it. Like you see the people at uh, RGA or any of those people, that, like the 10th Planet people that spend seven days a week training for four hours a day. 
and then they hit the road hard as far as tournaments, they that is more understandable for them to win it than somebody that does it four or five days a week, once a day. And so my expectations are just, I just want to get a win. Yeah. That'd be kind of the pinnacle of my jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so. and I think that's definitely like a, a realistic goal to have. And a lot of people, I think, can get wrapped up in their own heads thinking like, oh, I'm going to be ADCC champion. And, you know, if you put your mind to it and you, you put the time in and you do the actual training that's required, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. But if, if you're realistic with yourself and you realize that you're not going to be able to be training six hours a day, seven days a week, like... You know, it sounds like you might have been describing somebody similar to Keith Krikorian. I don't know. He yeah. said 10th Planet and training yeah. all the time. And, you know, with his uh, second place finish at ADCC Trials recently, uh, you know, that was, that was something I was really impressed with. Uh, Keith somebody that's continued to grow and grow. Uh, we had him on the very first subspectrum back in April of last year, April 2017. Crap. Yeah. It seems like it was like five years ago, but that was, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, and, you know, he took our first event at 145, took our second event at 155. Uh, well, he yeah. lost to Damian Anderson, which it's funny you brought that up about uh, lying to fight to win about the purple belt. I know Damian Anderson did that once. He he lied, told him he was a purple belt, and got on fight to win. Yeah. And then afterwards, it's like, yeah, I'm just a blue belt, and then got promoted almost immediately after. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he Keith lost to Damian uh, in the finals, of the 145, and then he came back and won the 155 this past time. Uh, we're looking to have him out for sub spectrum seven in March. Uh, March 2nd of next year, uh, just looking for an, an opponent to put opposite of him. You're not going to put 2018 like you have with all the other promos? <laughs> no, yeah. I keep putting that 2018. I'm always looking at this year's calendar. I forget to look ahead. I even, when I first set the qualifier date, I set it as January 20th because that was the <laughs> Saturday in January uh, for this, or well, yeah, for this year, 2018, and then it's actually the 19th. So, yeah, that'll be our, our 135 qualifier for well, Subspectrum. Keith also got second place at the 170 losing only to uh nate Fenton. yeah it was actually he didn't make the finals he was uh oh. yeah it was the semifinals is what it was oh that was the semis oh, yep okay. so there was four four-man groups keith you know he went three and oh submitted all three guys in his group and then he went to the semifinals oh, okay. lost to nate fenton by knee bar and then in the finals nate fenton submitted jacob bell by triangle oh yeah i remember that kid yep that somehow made 145, but he was bigger than me. Oh, he was huge, dude. Yeah. I faced him down in uh, Oklahoma, and I got a little lazy, turned my back to him. And usually when guys do that, they'll come up and like they'll body lock or do something like that. And he just jumped on my back like a backpack <laughs> and uh, eventually got an armbar finish out of it. But yeah, that was that was definitely a surprise. Yeah. It's crazy where subspectrums come from as far as talent. Obviously, there's Keith and Nate that were in the first ones, and then even Justin Fayback that have a lot of talent and now you have people that are coming from Montreal, New York, New Jersey, uh, West Coast with the Adam Bradley and Keith coming out. It's just insane where it's come from because we're barely, when I remember the promotion of the first few up until I want to say even this one maybe, but it was barely anybody outside the Midwest. Like nobody really knew of Keith at that point in time. Yeah, nobody had a clue. And I mean, it's crazy that there's still people in the jiu-jitsu world today that'd be like, who's Keith Krikorian? But yeah. I mean, if you follow the sub-only scene and, and you're paying attention to any of the tournaments around, I mean, the, the guy's been like the Gordon Ryan of the underground this year. He's just, he's taken cash at every single tournament. I was adding it up in my head the other day, and I think he's got to be pushing like 20 grand in, in cash winnings this this year uh, competing in jiu-jitsu. So that's, I mean, it's exciting for the sport, exciting for him that he's, you know, he's able to make this a job. But in, he's still a full-time student. That's yeah. the crazy thing, too. Is he's a full-time student. He's putting in 15 credit hours, you know, per semester, and he's still able to be one of the, you know, one of the best 145-pound cool. grapplers on the planet right he now. He took second ADCC trials, so. Yeah, I only mean, only loss coming to Ethan Crellinston. And, I mean, I don't know how much Ethan was attacking in that match, but Keith was all over his legs. I mean, Keith never finished the inside heel hook, but he was attacking the legs the entire time, uh, for the most part, dominating the entanglements. So yeah. very impressive to see him, you know, come from, you know, a purple belt that we had at our first tournament. It was like, oh, this guy's pretty good to now like, oh, okay, this guy's world class. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is a world class athlete we're dealing with here. He's going to be out at trials when I go out there for the West Coast in the East Coast had like 60 some people in his division and I would expect more for yep. this one because it's a last chance to qualify for anybody because I think Nicky Ryan didn't do it because he was hurt or injured or something along that line yeah I think he had a, a last minute injury like the week of the event yeah so he didn't do it so he's going to be out there again for the that division the 66 and under so 
it'll be interesting to be out there because now, I mean, outside of the United States, the the trials aren't huge. I mean, you just saw the one that was canceled for Asia and Oceania or yep. uh, Australia and all those ones. That sucks, but the United States probably had like 60, 70 people again. Yeah. Do you know what the date was for that Asian one? It's coming up this Saturday. So oh, really? They canceled it and they canceled it a there. week before. So Not there's got to be all kinds of people with travel plans and well, everything that got ruined. I was reading a post by Lachlan Giles is that not only did they mess up the travel dates for it, but people were going to take planes from there to go to Nogi Worlds. So their travel plans are really messed up now because they're not going to go out to Kazakhstan to travel. And that that's their flight to where I, I know your world is in LA, I think this year, maybe I knew that one year they had it in San Francisco, that cow palace, whatever year you went out there, but yep. I don't know. We'll see what's on the horizon. I hope to get into a 185 division here for myself, but the first few months I hope to come out for sub spectrum and compete there, but we'll see what goes along there. And then, uh, it looks like a couple people like, uh, Josh from, uh, I can't pronounce the last name. Leduc. The oh, oh, yeah. Sapatero. Sapatero, yeah. I, I, don't actually, know how to I, I, know. I actually meant to because before the last event, I was going to message him and say, How do I say your last name? So when I mention <laughs> it on the stream, I don't fuck it up. But uh, I never got around to it. So And we actually didn't have commentary because our whole internet shut down for the whole stream for the last event. It was kind of a, kind of a train wreck. But. It turned out well, though. At least you were able to go back and commentate over it. Yep. <laughs> I remember that one time you had gum in your mouth and everybody wanted to just <laughs> shoot you. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not chewing gum today while we're doing the podcast, which is, is pretty surprising. I, anybody that knows me knows I love to chew gum. I chew it while I'm rolling. Well, uh, there's like a video of me on an invitational, and I'm chewing gum while I'm playing Z-Guard against PJ Barch, and Hanato Laran just commentating. He's like, is Paisma chewing gum? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. And I don't know, like, the more I the more I travel and the more people I see, like, it's it's more common than, I, than a lot of people really think. I mean, yeah, it's it might seem kind of crazy, but... I don't know. I just don't think it's that weird to chew gum while you're rolling. When it comes to rolling and everything, I'm fine with it. But in competition, I won't do it because when somebody's going for like a uh, like a mandible crush or some sort of neck crank where my teeth are grinding, I like to bite down on my mouth guard so I don't chip anything. That's the only reason I don't. But one time I did when I went down to Brian Brown's. Uh, went Jacksonville Invitational and I had that match with that uh, I can't remember Brandon Osasio or something along that line I did have gum but that's the one where I gave the head nod and wink to Josh for Sabatero so basically you were pulling on me you're yeah, chewing gum it. you hit a sweep that yeah. I, I'm known Kimura for sweep. hitting the Kimura sweep from half guard and then you winked at the camera which yeah. is kind of something I would probably <laughs> do too so I was very proud of you for that performance for sure oh and it wasn't a leg lock yeah, you ended up taking his back and choking him out, right? Yeah, nice. That was, I that was probably going to the last. I can't even remember outside of leg locks. Most of my wins have been by leg locks. Uh, that's one that wasn't. Maybe a couple triangles here and there, but most of mine have just been from standard leg locks. Which, it's not even my favorite thing to do. I like getting to the back, but I always kind of throw that hail mary up at the beginning of a uh, match. And it, for whatever reason, it kind of works almost well, every time. You saw that on an invitational. Yeah. And it's just, there's some people that just, it almost looks like they're lost once you get on their leg. Like, especially if it's in the first 10 seconds of the match, they just, they're, they're fighting the hands instead of like paying attention to what they need to do to separating the feet and, and uh, like destroying the structure of the entanglement. They just kind of freak out. And uh, I think it's getting better and better, the, the level of leg lock defense. And just, I've seen that, you know, from subspectrum one to subspectrum seven. You know, also, you know, a factor that plays into that is the level of competition. You know, mm -hmm. the level of competition has continued to rise and rise every single event. But, you know, now you're not seeing those quick, like, 10-second finishes by heel hook anymore. Yeah. Which isn't, you know, good well, and, I like, wouldn't say bad, but, yeah. I felt bad because the guy had, the guy took the match and he was underweight. He was a purple belt, I believe. I'm not sure, but... There's, it looked like he was like 20 pounds lighter than me. He, was, he, <laughs> he looked was, like he was like 155. <laughs> he was a small guy. I was really surprised that they even set up the match and accepted it. I think they brought me in as kind of like a alternate in case somebody didn't make way or somebody got injured and I already had my travel plans for because they did the 185 tournament the same day. Um, but I was just, I, I mean, he took the match and everything. I don't know if he was 65 or 55, 
But the, my only, th- I, I was going to get paid for the match if I won, no matter what. But my only thought was to get the quickest submission. And at the time, I was training at NoCos, and I said, there had been a discussion to have me stop doing leg locks in competition, start working <laughs> towards other things. And I said, that's fine. I'll do that, this competition. But I need to at least attempt to throw a Hail Mary in the first 30 seconds. I get one attempt. And that's all I asked for. It was agreed upon, perfectly fine. And I got it, the heel hook in 13 seconds or whatever. But you've been to a lot of the matches that I competed at. And for whatever reason, like when we went up to Bruce Hoyer's in Sioux Falls, like that's there's like five matches in which I heel hooked the guy within 15, 30 seconds. Yeah. It was funny, but that drive sucked. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I drive it. Uh, the worst, and so I was thinking about today, you, you'll be able to answer this too, but my worst experience, we traveled all, the, all over the Midwest, yep. um, driving and just to compete one day and then coming back the next, not even taking vacations really. But in my opinion, the very worst one as far as how things, the commitment to it and all that was when we went to Oklahoma City. That was the very worst because we drove there an eight-hour drive, eight-and-a-half, nine-hour drive. I got there at one or two in the morning, woke up at seven to compete. I had two matches. And I think I had maybe two or three. It was a really short day. But I, I... I did pull one thing, one good thing away from that trip is uh, I had a match with James yeah. Partridge, and at the time, you know, he was a, a much higher level. I was like a, almost a brand new blue belt at the time. He was a brown belt, and uh, he had just faced Gordon Ryan. He'd done some bigger tournaments and kind of made a little bit of a name for himself, and uh, so I was like really excited to face him. And I, you know, I ended up losing. Still, it was like forty-five seconds, maybe a minute. But like in the first minute, I threw like a rolling Kimura. I took his back. Uh, I went to like a like spider web arm bar position and then he got out and eventually heel hooked me. But like to get that uh, to get that match in with somebody that I thought was so much higher level than me and to be able to like attain some some positive positions, be able to do some positive things in the match that gave me a ton of confidence. So aside from the shitty drive and you know just driving halfway across the country to referee and do two matches, uh, I did pull something really positive away from that match and it's something that I want to continue to like. Um, it's like play off of is going into matches where where I'm likely going to lose. And, you know, that's why I did it on Invitational. You know, obviously it wasn't my choice, but first round I got PJ Barge. <laughs> you know, I could have just canceled my plane ticket, got my money back and said, screw that. I'm not going all the way to Austin to face PJ Barge and lose. And But um, I gained a ton of confidence from that match too. You know, I threw on a toehold attempt in there. Uh, there were a couple things that where – I maybe thought I could have swept him, uh, you know, whether or not I actually would have is one is a totally different story. But, you know, I had the positions that, that I would normally be getting against guys at my own level. So even though I took the loss and, you know, that one was a little bit longer, you know, four or five minutes into the match, ended up, uh, he ended up taking my back and finishing that back mount triangle. But getting all that confidence from, from facing high level guys and knowing that, you know, they're human, you know, they can be submitted, they can be beaten. They're not, they're not just supermen out there with, uh, powers that are unattainable yeah in going out to the on it i actually had a great experience out there because they give you everything they like here's all of these products here's a rash guard all of that and it's a lot different than our days where it's oh here's a gold medal yep or yeah here's like a five dollar medal yeah it's yeah. nice to go to those like professional events and that's what i'm trying to do more and more with subspectrum is get more product sponsors on board so that, you know we can give away these goodie bags with supplements and you know maybe some cbd products or you know whatever other things that jiu-jitsu guys like to have uh, and be able to give that stuff away to the guys so even if they don't go home you know with a bunch of money in their pockets at least they go home with something and and feel like they got a, something out of the experience. Going back and seeing, because now you're posting a lot of the archived matches, it's really crazy to see how it's grown uh, from just being a couple couches set up around <laughs> a, a couple mats to being able to rent out the community center. It was a community center for Dallas Center Grimes. Or Grimes yeah, uh, the Grimes Community Center, yeah. yeah. And we had about, I think it was like 120 people for that one. So I think that's the most we've ever had in attendance for one of these events. And then I... What was it, Subspectrum 4, where the, the April, last April? Yep. The one yeah. I was in? Or was that 5? Nope, that was 4. four. Yeah, yeah, 5 was the kids' one, so okay. nobody even remembers that one. But yeah, yeah 4 was the 155 pound championship. Okay. Keith won. And then we had the feature matches. Uh, main event uh, was Matt Layton and yeah. Jared Dopp. I, so that was that was a big like takeoff point for us was to, you know, that 155 bracket was stacked. Yeah. There was the top 
four or five guys easily could have won that bracket. You know, you had Keith Krikorian, you had uh, Sean Weisenberg who won the Submission Underground one. Uh, we had uh, Alexander it? Rahacic who won the Metamorphs Challenger. We had Pierre from TriStar up there. So like those top four guys in that 155 was really big. So that well, like, you also had Jordan Holly. Jordan Holly was another big one. Yeah, he I forget about him because Holly. I'm not sure. All right, well, sorry. You're I've right. met him like a handful of times, and I don't even know. Holy, Holly? Let us know. <laughs> uh, I think it's holy based on the Holy Grail thing. I could be wrong. Whatever. I'm sorry. Uh, but, yeah, that. so that day, people don't probably realize you also ran a day tournament for people, too, for both, abs- for absolute within almost all belt ranks, except for brown and black yep. males. Yeah, so we had the, a full kids tournament, full teens tournament, and then we had uh, adults. We had an absolute at each belt rank we had a, a no gi uh, for blue and white belt and then we had gi for white blue and uh, purple belt and we were able to give away cash prizes for all of those that's something i really like to be able to do and that's something i'm going to continue to do when we do uh, the march 2nd event but this time there's going to be like full adult divisions so gi and no gi weight classes belt everything but then there'll be absolute divisions which will have cash prizes as well so i always want to have some form of of a cash prize for the for the amateur grapplers that aren't doing the pro style events. I was really nervous because a lot of people don't know. I also did the day tournament. And I had seven matches that day. Yeah, because they were they were uh, round robin, so it was an eight man round robin. So you had yeah. seven seven full matches during the day, and then, and the, then match the, the match at night. And I was nervous. Like I had an, my first match was against a very good competitor. He was actually in your uh, last subspectrum six subject. Uh, Danikas. Uh, yeah. And we had a long match, and I had an adrenaline dump. So I was like, but I didn't realize it was an adrenaline dump. I thought I was just exhausted and mm-hmm. didn't have, but ended up getting through all my matches and then having probably because I have not had a lot of super matches, super fights, feature matches, whatever you want to label them. Because of that, I was really nervous going into that because I had seen Maurice compete before, and I was like, well, this guy, he, what, he, was Shark Tank at one of the subspectrums? Yeah, because he, he he showed up like a half hour late to uh, one of the competitions, and so instead of disqualifying him from the event, what we did is we just uh, skipped all of his matches, and then when he showed up, he had to do all of his round robin matches right in a row. And I think he won like two or three right in a row, and then right at the end, he lost that match to uh, Tom Higgins. And they went to overtime, I believe. Yeah, they were going to go to overtime, but oh. apparently Maurice like, dislocated his shoulder during Maurice, regulation. Like so at the, yeah, at the end of regulation, he just he just called it off. Yeah. It was his final match for the day, so he just called off the overtime and forfeited. But Yeah, so I saw all those matches take place, and I'm like, well, damn, now I have to face him. So going into that, I was like, well, worst comes to worst, I'll do the day turn, man, should be fine. Well, no, I faced uh, that Johnny Denicus. And we had a long match. I was like, well, this is going to be a long day. And then there was a giant in there. I can't remember his name, but yeah, there was a fun time being able to do both tournaments and then having that uh, match and then watching Jared Dobb versus Matt Layton. That was awesome. Yeah. Because the whole crowd is just completely quiet because they know what's going on. They know some epic shit is happening and they're just in awe the whole time. Yeah, and just what Matt was able to do in that match, too, is really impressive. I mean, Jared, as everybody already knows, I mean, he's he's an ADCC runner-up, silver medalist at, uh, I think it was 2013, maybe 2015. I don't remember exactly. But uh, for Matt to go in there, and it, it wasn't the Gi, so, you know, that's Matt's platform for sure. But uh, Matt was able to sweep him a couple times. He's almost able to take his back. He's able to get to, like, that crab ride position. Never able to get the, the full seatbelt in both hooks. But uh, still an incredibly perform- uh, imp- eh, incredibly Perf- Why can I talk impressive? right now? Impressive <laughs> performance. Yeah, my words are all all jacked up right now. It's yeah. probably because I'm looking at the audio on the computer. I probably need to just turn my screen <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things that really impressed me is I know Jared Dopp is a very strong guy. I've watched some of his things on Instagram, and like I read some things that he's shared on Facebook, etc. So being able to see that sort of performance in the gi. It actually makes me more motivated to train in the gi instead of because it's an exciting match. Yeah, a lot of the stereotypes around gi matches are that they're boring. Well, they're not that boring when you have high level people doing high level things. Mm-hmm. Now we've both refed hundreds of matches in the gi, and we can probably t- like agree that a lot of gi matches are boring, but at the highest level they're not. Yeah, at the highest level they're not because it's just like every little move could 
could end the day for that person. You know, like if you get a certain grip or you get you know something in a certain place, a certain hook in a certain place. I mean, that could be, that could end the or spell the end of the match for that person. And uh, I mean, to see Matt do that. I mean, he's quite a bit smaller than Jared. I think he probably was outweighed by 15, 20 pounds or so in that match. And I mean, you know, as an ADCC silver medalist, you have to think that he was like almost impossible to sweep. That was the one thing that I thought was going to uh, pose a problem for Matt in that match was that he wasn't going to be able to sweep him. And he was, he was able to sweep him, I think two, maybe three times. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, with the, with the attempted back takes and everything, it's, he was definitely able to get his offense off in that match, which was really impressive. Yeah. That's really awesome. Um, that reminds me with your next sub spectrum, you're doing a team one, right? Yeah, so in addition to the men's and women's 135-pound tournaments, uh, we will also be doing a four-team Iowa dual-team championships. So uh, four of the best gyms from around the uh, like the central Iowa area, uh, mostly Des Moines and Iowa City. Uh, there's going to be a bonsai team out of Tipping Point. There'll be one out of No Coast. And then the other two spots just uh, still need to be filled. Uh, potentially Hard Drive Performance Center up in uh, Cedar Rapids. And then maybe like Des Moines Jiu Jitsu or uh, Elite Edge here in Des Moines, but uh, those each of those uh, schools is going to put together a five person team. So there'll be a women's 135, there'll be a men's 155, men's 175, men's 195, and then a men's 195 plus. So those will be the five spots that'll be available on the dual team, and then it'll be a, a straight up five on five duel against uh, another school. And the way the scoring system is going to work out, so. Um, we can get into the, the new subspectrum rule set here in a second, but um, the basically what it's going to be is a sub or sub only regulation with a scored overtime period. So if you record a submission in the regulation period, that'll score six points for your team, the way a, a pin does in wrestling. Uh, if you get a submission in the overtime period, that'll be five points, the same way it is for like a tech fall in wrestling, five points. Four points will be if you win by six or more in overtime. That'll be considered a a major decision. So if you take someone down, you pass their guard, and then you mount them or take their back, that would be enough to warrant uh, basically a major decision in overtime. And then um, just a regular decision would be five or less points in overtime, but winning by five five or less points, uh, and that will score three points for your team. So, you know, that's going to create some some tense situations because you know you're going into your last match your team might be down by four and you you need a submission either you know so at some point in the match to get that five or six points in order for your team to win and uh the stalling calls are also going to be something that comes into play i'm really excited about the way that we're going to start punishing stalling uh, and try to get that out of our of our event totally and it's not it's not something that's like you know every event we have somebody that's stalling like crazy but uh, i think the rule set is able to be manipulated pretty easily and uh, with this new rule set, I can't imagine that anybody's going to be able to stall and still go on and win. And the thing to take away from that is, if you're able to do it, especially when there's no ins- like there's no there's an incentive to do so. So if I get my pay is not going to be different if I stall or whatever. I I think I have less of a chance of doing this. I understand that if the difference is me stalling and me not stalling for two thousand dollars. I'd probably do it too. And I think a lot of people have started to do that with the EBI rules. And it was great at first. It's great when both combatants are in there to put it all in line, but some people just don't. And I, I completely understand that. If like my whole entire plane ticket and all that coming out or my ride or whatever is $2,000 or $0 for yeah. me to stall. I get I'll it, man. Stall. Do what yeah. you got to do to win. Yeah. yeah. I, and I mean... It's, it, and that's why I decided I had to change the rules. I couldn't put it on the competitors anymore. It's not their fault. They're simply just trying to win yeah. within, the, within the potential rule set. And so I had to change the rules. And uh, so I guess let's just go ahead and get into that, like the new rule set. So like I said before, it's going to be a six-minute. for These are uh, for the pro events. Uh, obviously, the regular t- day tournament and those things will be different. And the dual team will have its own uh, little set of rules. But uh, for, the, for the professional events, it'll be a six-minute sub-only regulation, a three-minute scored overtime with uh, like a IBJJF or ADCC-style point system. And then uh, at the end of that, if, if it's for whatever reason it's still tied, uh, then it'll continue going until sudden death. So after that nine minutes, if it's still tied, it's going to continue going until sudden death. But uh, now we'll kind of talk about like the, the stalling warnings. So every, every competitor will get a stalling warning. 
uh, you know, your one warning. And then once you get your second stall, you know, basically first stalling call or second warning for stalling, that will be, uh, you know, your first stall. I can't even talk right now. So when you get called for stalling the very first time, uh, you're going to be put into a position. So we're going to bring the referee's position from wrestling. So, you know, on the hands, on the knees, elbows locked out, person on tops, chest to back uh, with a waist grip and a hand on the elbow. Right. So if you're stalling, you're going to go to the bottom of referee's position. And I mean, right away, you're going to be defending your back immediately. So if both competitors are deemed to be stalling simultaneously, we're going to put them in a position we like to call the scramble position. So that's what it's going to be called within our promotion. Uh, it's actually a drill that we did a lot when I was at Autos when we trained out there. So it's both guys in referee's position facing opposite directions with one arm over the back. <laughs> so it's basically just a, a race to the back to see who can get there first. And, you know, so if both guys are stalling, we're going to put them in that position and then you're going to be forced to engage. You know, if both guys don't want to engage in that position, you have to engage because if, you, if you're going to, if you're going to stall in that position, you're going to get your back taken, and then that's probably going to spell the end of the match or, you know, being dominated for the entire match, which which will uh, eventually end in a loss. So, second stalling call. Because of the way that we've changed the payout format, now the winner will not be the only person who walks away with money. So, for every match you win at Subspectrum, there'll be uh, a cash prize. So, for the eight-man tournaments, the first round, if you win in the first round, you're going to win $100. So, you'll basically get your entry fee back immediately if you win in the first round. If you win in the second round, semifinals, you're going to get a $200 cash bonus. Right? So, going into the finals, you could have already cashed $300 worth of, uh, of earnings. And then the finals match is going to be a $700 match. The winner of that match will take home $700. So, the winner will take home $1,000. Second place will take home $300. And then third and fourth will take home $100. So, because we're able to do that, uh, the second stalling call will be you are no longer able to receive compensation for that match. That would be huge for a lot. I like how that plays out because... Um, I do have another question about the uh, five versus five, yeah. but it with EBI you're seeing a lot of people not wanting to enter. Like I think Eddie Cummings talked about it specifically before he pulled out in EBI fifteen is that people were maybe he's gonna go and then stall the whole time and all of that because the I love EBI's rules and how they don't reward points and they incentivize finishing. But the thing is you'll have a lot of people that win their first couple matches and then when it gets down to the finals, well, if there's no compensation already, well, like we were saying, they may have won their 15,000. If the difference is 5,000, why not just stall till overtime, you know? Yeah, and ultimately it's, it's, I mean, yeah, it's great to have that full 20,000, but to have the belt and just to be known as the EBI champion, you still got 15 grand, yeah. you're doing all right. Like, you know, there's definitely a lot of incentive to still uh, yeah. play within the rule set. So I'm excited to see how that turns out and Obviously, there's going to be growing pains behind it, but it could birth an entire new like era, I guess. Because right now we're kind of in the EBI era. I would I would say, previous it was there's only you know points and everything, but or no time limit. But it'll be very interesting to see how this goes out. I'm excited to see how it plays out too, and that's just for the uh, uh, tournaments, correct? It, are you? When you evolve down the line, are you going to do that for feature matches or? Uh, so the, yeah, that's going to be for everything now. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we're done. We were we tried the the judge thing for that one, and uh, for whatever reason, I just didn't like it. It's it had nothing to do with the judges or the way that they scored any of the fights. But I just I hate taking the win and putting it in like the hands of somebody else. Yeah. Somebody, you know, somebody else's decision to figure out who won, and it's it's so hard. I mean. You can set a criteria, you know, s submission attempts, but if somebody should throws up three shitty submission attempts, but one guy has, like, a really good actual submission attempt that's close to finishing, mm -hmm. you know, one judge might see that one way, another judge might see it another way. So I wanted to take that out of the hands of, of any judge or referee or anything like that and, and kind of put it on the fighters. So with those harsh stalling calls, you're going to be forced to engage throughout the entire match or else, you know, one, you're not going to receive compensation. And yeah, I don't think I ever got back around to it, but third stalling warning is going to be deep. You. So that's pretty simple. And the way we're going to do it, I think, is if at any point in a match you get that second stalling call where you don't receive compensation for that match, but you still go on to win that match for whatever reason, that's going to carry over into the next match. So if you get called for a, a stalling warning at the beginning of the next match, you've already gotten those two stalling warnings in a previous match, you're going to get DQ'd in that next match because... Oh. because Don't just, stall? Yeah, just don't stall. It's yeah. pretty simple. And 
I think a lot of people are uh, misinterpreting what I mean by stalling. They think that just like if somebody gets on top and side control and has strong shoulder of justice and is just kind of like sitting there hanging out in side control, that they're going to get called for stalling, which actually isn't the case. Uh, if anything, if the person on bottom With, is I know not doing anything to try to get up off the, the bottom, they're just campus. laying there and like throwing Speaking their hands up, like, hey, why, why don't you stand do you know this up? The Iowa City, the you're going to be the one that gets called for stalling because you're not doing So I definitely wanted to include just because they've done previous really strong position. Tony Curry, I think he'll likely be there really 155 down past uh, Nate Fenton, easy who's, thing to do. I mean, he's undefeated. So if you get to that position and you're kind of like sitting there six or beans, probably six to matches to win that 170 in the very first event. Uh, he wants to feature match at Subspectrum uh, 4. He wants to go for your submission at Subspectrum 6. So he's undefeated within the promotion. Uh, I'd like so to see him don't, on their team at 175. Just because you're in a dominant Matt Layton presumably would be there. We are going to need five, but he's actually said that he's in more interested in doing a feature match that could bring like a headliner. Now, Headliner that, type of uh, atmosphere that, to the that's event. Gonna be great. It's gonna there's be a, great a match that I'm working on with him from somebody out east. I uh, can't really say anything game. about it yet, just because uh, <laughs> yeah. I haven't really heard back from the guy. So I don't want to blast his name out there and then have a bunch of people asking him why he hasn't accepted the match yet. But that that I think is we'll probably put Matt in that feature match position, and then John Gutta. I think he's probably around 195. Nate said that he would be interested in being involved. So their woman's maybe Claire. I think Claire's probably going to be there 135. They, she won the women's come, absolute at the last um, one, that, uh, Brown Belt from Iowa City. So, I mean, they're, they're going to definitely be probably so, the favorite team to beat. I mean, they're all of their people are basically either yeah. undefeated or uh, have won their last few matches at Subspectrum. So that would be what? The, Tony Curry would be the only purple belt, then Claire and Nate would be brown belts, and the other two would be black belts, if they put out their A team, yep. I suppose. Absolutely. So that would be really cool to see, to bring that type of, atmosphere to Des Moines, Iowa because not not to disrespect or anything for the Des Moines area but it's never been really jiu-jitsu oriented it's always been MMA first Yep. and that's what the crazy part is is now you're starting to see these large tournaments you going out to on it myself competing and everybody going out in the Iowa region or the Midwest region excuse me and Competing is now kind of putting Des Moines on the map. And then with what Bonsai's done and going out and doing their IBGJF stuff, whether it's at, at Worlds, because Claire, I think, won Masters Worlds for Guy earlier this year, I believe. Could be wrong, but I think she came here and did an open mat with us. And she said, no leg locks unless they're IBGJF legal. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And yeah, no, they, they had uh, another guy that won... He went out. I mean, it was white belt. Worlds, oh, it was Darren, but, yeah, yeah, Darren. You know, he's he beat Jim Morris, guy from our gym that a lot of people. He was two hundred and eighty pounds, former football and power lifter. You know, really scary guy here in the gym, and to see Darren Kreiner go out there and submit him was really impressive. No, it wasn't a submission. It was, was not. It was oh, was points. it? Was it points? Okay, yeah. so I, I was mistaken there. Yeah. I had a lot going on that day, so I kind of forgot. Jim would kill me if I didn't correct him. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you that. But yeah, well, he'd probably kill me too. So. <laughs> But yeah, so they have a lot of talent when it comes to just jiu-jitsu, and it's great to see that you, I had never had the opportunity, or never took the opportunity, I should say, to go out there and train with them, but I've always been friendly with them. But I know you've gone out to Nate's school and trained with them a little bit. You've gone out to Iowa City a couple of times, and they've come here to a few open mats. John even had a seminar out here, and to see the cohesiveness and to work as a team to promote the jiu-jitsu um, life, I guess you'd say, around here and just let people be more aware of it in the Iowa area. That's great because 10 years ago, you, I mean, it's all MMA schools that they have a wrestling background yep. and they don't really know that much jiu-jitsu, even when it comes to like the technical aspects. And maybe they saw something on TV and like, oh, I'm going to figure out how it works. And they don't Teach really private do. lessons yeah. off YouTube. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's what a lot of it used to be because Des Moines or the gap is closed with how much access there has been to other the to jiu jitsu information compared to ten years ago. I get that Des Moines jiu jitsu has been around forever. I mean, I think Chris he's at least two thousand. I want to say he's been doing this forever. Yeah, um, been a black belt for a really long time. Yeah, so he's led the charge for Des Moines for such a long time. And, but they're always an MMA school too. I don't know how much 
jiu-jitsu they actually like how much competition they did I know Appenzeller went to ADCC trials uh, a few years ago I want to say 2013 like 2013 14 somewhere in there and um, competed there but it's great to see everything evolve and no being able to because we've both gone to San Diego I've gone to Florida we've gone to Chicago we've gone all sorts of places and trained and competed it's great to see that we aren't behind mm-hmm. like we aren't some uh, I guess I shouldn't say we anymore because I'm in Arizona but it's great to see that the level of skill there's not a huge gap as you would expect with people that are so isolated from the main routes because outside of uh, you have like Obviously, the East Coast, there's Florida, New York, all those, New Jersey, Virginia, those schools. And then you have the West Coast with California and some in Arizona. Um, and then there's scattered, there's like Lovato School in Oklahoma and the Texas schools have a lot of the Machados down there. But the Midwest has kind of been left out except for um, Chicago. Yeah. So it's great to see everything grow. But yeah, so it's cool to see it. That it's kind of on the up yeah and that's been one of the coolest thing for me running subspectrum is just being able to connect with so many people in the midwest and and to realize how cool everybody really is i mean i think before you meet a bunch of people with with being like a combat sport you kind of just assume that everybody's kind of got a chip on their shoulder and that they might be kind of like staring you down at tournaments and stuff like that but as as much as i've uh, interacted with the people from iowa city all the people from downtown i mean it's, it really is like a cohesive unit, and we're all working together to try to promote Iowa Jiu-Jitsu. And at the head of that is Matt Layton, for sure. I mean, he's probably the highest level competitor that we have in the state right now. Um, debuted as a black belt, I think, last year's, I think, five or six and one on the Fight to Win stage. Uh, only loss coming to Tim Spriggs, who's <laughs> no joke whatsoever, obviously, ADCC Trials winner. I want, one thing I do want to point out is when you're looking for an opponent for Matt for the last show... And somebody tagged Tim, and Matt's response was, "I want no part of that man." Yeah, I thought that was the best response ever because yeah. obviously he's like kidding around, but that response just tells you what kind of competitor Tim is. Yeah, that he has a really high level of respect for uh, the level that Tim is at. Because uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was pretty funny. <laughs> but no, it it's cool. It's cool to see even with Nokos. Uh, going to what it is now because I was there when within the first month of it starting and there'd be like five people in class Yeah, and everybody rolled with everybody and now there's what sometimes up to 30 people in classes even more like Monday nights sometimes we've got like 40 people on the mats and it, it gets crazy we sometimes do like three man groups or something just to keep people off to the side so that we don't have everybody rolling all at once or else there's going to be heels and headbutts and all kinds of crazy stuff that's insane I don't know We'll see what comes out with 2019, though. I know you're going to do the team term and everything like that, but it's exciting to see Subspectrum come from where it came because it was pretty much... <laughs> I'll never forget the time that uh, Jams had Justin Fabex back control for 10 minutes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> 15 minutes, I think it was. That's insane. I couldn't believe how long that actually lasted, but I'm glad they started to implement those uh, caps on time. Yeah, but. We'll yeah, we ha- we had to do that after that event, and and it was you know another thing where Jams was just playing within the rule set. What he did was not wrong, yeah. you know from the from the eyes of the rule set. He didn't do anything wrong by holding that back position in overtime for fifteen minutes. I mean, he had it in his mind that he was gonna get Justin to just say, "I quit." Like I I can't get out of this back control anymore. I quit. But uh, you know, I was watching the stream, and you see the viewers go from like. 50 down to 40 down to 30 and by the time we're 15 minutes into the overtime there's like seven people watching because they're so tired of watching the same thing and ultimately we're trying to make this entertaining for people you know we want it we want people to continue to come back and watch subspectrum because it's exciting so once again i had to change those rules because i can't put it on the competitors i can't put it on them to to make that change i have to change it within the rules and then uh, make them adapt to them well yeah i mean if it really came down to it it if it wasn't about spectators, it'd just be no time limit, all subs. Yeah. That's all you would do. But the thing is, you know, if you did that all day, you would literally be there all day because you'd have matches. I mean, outside, I know there's been talk of the Keenan and Gordon one that lasts an hour and a half, but we both have seen matches that go 45 minutes because um, Sub Challenge, the, the promotion that we started out doing the 
a lot of our tournaments with, they used to have 20 minute rounds. So, and then the finals would be unlimited time. And yep. we saw, I think it was Nate Garvey that had like a 45 minute match. That That's just insane. Yeah. It just, and it kind of makes it impossible to forecast when your tournament's going to end. And I actually saw, isn't Grappling Industries doing something now where they have, they're doing no time limit matches? Oh God! I'm pretty sure they are, because like they were saying, you know, nobody nobody said that a round robin tournament could be done because of time, and now I think they're doing no time limit matches. Uh, it's like a it's a different sect of their event. It won't be like all grappling industries events, but I'm pretty sure I saw that at least some of their events now will be no time limit, which is interesting. I don't know how they're going to be able to pull that off. I mean, I guess in most situations somebody is going to get submitted. In yeah, and it usually we out. It's really weird because. The small, the bigger the competitors are, the more time that's taken. I would say from my referees, st- we spent so much time refereeing that it was usually the bigger guys that had the issues as far as finishing early. My experience, I guess, because most of the smaller guys, for whatever reason, are always exciting. <laughs> I'm don't, sorry. Don't. I'm sorry. I heard you say big guys <laughs> finishing early, Listen, and it just made me made me laugh. We're gonna fra- <laughs> we're gonna phrase here. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It's pretty crazy. It's really it. Looking at it all for full circle is that you and I have both done very prestigious terms outside of the the A list group. You know. Whatever you want. Yeah, we obviously haven't done EBI or Polaris or Kasai or any yeah. of those, but you know, Ana Invitational, uh, so, Jiu-Jitsu Kumite, Global Grappling League out so, there on the East Coast. Uh, yeah, you did Submission Underground. I forget about that. Um, so yeah, it's it's cool that we've been able to represent from Central Iowa uh, at some of the bigger tournaments out there and show that there's there's some decent Jiu-Jitsu here in Iowa. It's maybe not world class yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. And there's no. people, you know, and you know, Nate Fenton. I mean. He didn't. He hasn't gone out to some of the bigger tournaments and won, but to win that sub spectrum, the first one he did was a big deal. Uh, to win the last two matches that he's won are, are good matches and good wins for him. Uh, Tony Curry, I think he went out to uh, Pan Ams maybe like two years ago and got second behind a guy from Atos. Um, John Gutta's, you yeah. know, he's he's he's, he's Megaton once. Yeah, he's he, he's beaten Megaton. He's faced Keenan Cornelius. Yeah. I mean, he's faced Josh Hinger. He's faced you know some really high level guys. So it's cool that we've got people representing out there on the biggest stages. Now, one thing I am going to ask is when we went to Wanderlust, right? You remember that? Oh, yeah. Not Chicago. Woodstock, Illinois. No, yeah, sorry. That was definitely not Chicago. Um, Grayson, (laughs) if you're listening to this, that's not Chicago. (laughs) Don't advertise it as that shit. Um, When you were being introduced and you heard your name, what ran through your mind? For the people that are listening, if you're still listening at this point, we went into weigh-ins and the promoter called Jordan a ginger. So I ran with it. And when we got to the event, I told the announcer to call Jordan the ginger ninja. And Jordan had no idea about this. So they're calling his name out and they call him Jordan the ginger ninja Pitesman. And he turns around and looks at us confused as hell. Now, I'm wondering, what was your reaction when you heard that? Um, I mean, I can't really, you know, it's kind of hard to b- think back that far and remember, but it's, it's just kind of like something that takes you back. Like, you know, <laughs> you're expecting to just hear your normal name, Jordan Peitzman, and all of a sudden you hear the Ginger Ninja, and you kind of look left and right, and like, what the fuck? And then all of a sudden I'm like, it was Derek, that son of a bitch. <laughs> and I looked down at you, because actually your match was right before mine, and I was cornering your match. So I didn't even walk back to the backstage area for my walkout. So my music starts playing, and I just hop up on the stage, and everyone's like, where'd this guy come from? And then I just hear Jordy the Ginger Ninja Pitesman, and you know, just taking it back by a couple, for a couple seconds until I realized it was you guys. You guys are laughing in the corner, <laughs> and then I'm like, well, I still got to go out there and do business. And... That was, that was a match where I, was, I felt really loose and really like fun, so I was able to go out there and have a good match and, and a good performance against a, a decently formidable opponent. That See, that match I was a huge underdog for because I was facing a brown belt. That, Ramses. Yeah, I was very... Cause, I think he uh, does a Oh So Crazy podcast really? now. Uh, I think the group of people out there at Comprito School do a podcast now too, so... <laughs> Maybe sometime we'll have to get them yeah. all in here together and we can do something too. But uh, yeah, back to back to your match there at Wanderlust. Well, I fucked up Subspectrum. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, because <laughs> he was uh, he was actually supposed to face Nate in the event. Uh, like I think two it was, weeks later. Uh, it was like it was a little over a month later. Yeah, because was that, it a month? Oh no, it was two weeks later. I'm yeah. thinking of a different event that I did earlier in March. But yeah, that was like March 30th, and then Subspectrum was April 21st, and his knee was not ready to go for the match with Nate, <laughs> so we had to have a uh, Jedi Queen step in there against Nate. Fenn. Looking at all Miami Vice coming in here and shit. <laughs> <laughs> a white button up yeah. shirt. With white a pants. I'm ban- bandana on his head, looking yeah. fancy as fuck. I think I still have some pictures from that way in. I might have to post those pictures. I think you should. They'll definitely enjoy it. But I don't know. It's just, it's all come full circle. It's really crazy. We'll see how everything in Arizona turns out. But I'm excited to see how. I just saw today that they're going to do the World Series of Jiu Jitsu out there. I might do that um, because it's in the same city as me and it's a $100 entry or something. So see how that goes. Yeah. Outside of that, just if I'm waiting on grappling industries because. There's nobody in my division for it, so there's all that. But outside of that, it's just crazy. A lot of stuff. There's more to talk about, but I don't even know where to start with most of it. Yeah, there's just maybe like one or two things I wanted to cover, and then we can wrap this up. Um, So, Subspectrum, obviously. Subspectrum 7 is coming up March 2nd of next year, and you've made some... uh, some statements about wanting to come out and compete. Is there anybody that you would maybe want to get a match against? There's a couple people. Um, but it depend- I, I understand if they don't want to do it because I'm a little bit bigger than I used to be. Um, there's Anthony Pacek, Pacek. Oh, yep. And then there's Nate Fenton. Both of them, my last loss was to Anthony um, at Sub Challenge a couple years ago. And then uh, Nate... I want to have a match with just because I know how good he is. Um, there's no disrespect on any level, but I think it would be fun no matter what um, for any one of them, depending on if – now, if they're in the team, I understand that. Compete for your team. Um, I'm sure somebody else will want to step up. Yeah. But I definitely want a rematch with Anthony. I was supposed to before. So when I left Jiu-Jitsu, like I said earlier in the podcast, I actually had two to three matches – lined up and uh jordan had to just show me something real quick on the computer <laughs> yeah i'm uh, I'm, sh- I'm showing derek the uh, website i'm working on in the top of the fighter application page is a picture of nate and anthony shaking hands <laughs> powerful anthony paycheck with that beautiful dan severn style mustache is that the reason that you quit jujitsu so that you wouldn't have to face that mustache i didn't want that on my face <laughs> no but it, it sucks because I had a lot of things lined up because I was also going to go out to that on invitational that you were at. They were going to give me, I was supposed to face some brown belt. I don't even remember his name at this time. John something. Mm -hmm. I think he still competed, but I felt bad, but I really needed to take a step back from jujitsu, from everything and reorganize my life and get things organized for that before I came back. But yes, going into the next sub spectrum, I would love a match with Nate or Anthony. Uh, whichever one works out. Uh, I know Nate won th- their match, so I don't know if that sets him up as first choice or what. But either way, a match with either one of them. Um, I don't really know anybody else in the Midwest that would have a great match with, but mm-hmm. obviously there's people out there. I just forget people's names most of the time. Yeah, and we'll have to see. I mean, I'll just talk with those guys and see if if the weight difference is going to be something that bothers them. I know Nate's, Nate's always expressed interest in competing against you. Well, he, he has a lot of respect for you as a competitor. and uh, I mean, after he, he, Obviously, he was a little upset that you uh, took his opponent out uh, <laughs> you know, a few weeks before he was supposed to face off against him. But Well, so we'll go back to the very first subspectrum then real quick, is that I, was, I cut down all the way to 170, and it was going to be set up where – not set up, excuse me. It, it potentially had the matchup for me and Nate to face each other, but Keith took my spot because mm-hmm. I was injured two days before that. Yeah. I had cut 15 pounds over that time to go ahead and make 170, and then I get injured like literally two days before weigh-ins. My very last hard roll, last roll of the night, and I tore my LCL. And then Keith took my spot, but after he beat Keith, he asked me, for, he's like, hopefully next time it's you. Like, he wanted to match with me. So, yeah. I never really, inter- not that I didn't entertain the idea, but he's a brown belt. I'm a blue belt. It never really would work out unless we set up a match like this. Yep. So, 
That's a great thing about no geese. We don't have to worry about belt levels or anything. Yeah. And and there's so much discrepancy too. There's like, and I'm not saying that like Nate's a lower level than that. It's, if anything, you're a higher level. Like in no gee, you're a higher level. I think if you went, you know, if you went into a tournament of gi, maybe against other blue belts, it'd probably be pretty even, especially at the highest levels. But if if we're talking no gee, I think that you can definitely compete at the purple and brown belt level against a, a decent handful of competitors. So uh, I, I don't think it would be a mismatch by any means. Um, you know, you would have a little bit of weight on either guy, but I think it would either way it'd be an exciting match. I definitely agree. That'll be those. I think as far as Iowa talent, um, those are probably the, I mean, for the weights and everything, there's not very many. For the weight, the talent level and all of that, there's not going to be very many more exciting matches in the Midwest, to yep. be completely honest, from my standpoint. So yep. hopefully we get that set up for March. Yes, yes. All right, well, uh, I think did, that covers just did you, you I thought anything? you said you had one more thing. No. No, no, at least nothing that I can remember. Okay. No, that's fine. I All appreciate right. you having me out. Uh, yeah. Hopefully I'm back out in March. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up.